characters here and getting everything to come together is just a little dicey. Okay. My intention was clear back in April. If you can recall back when civilization still existed uh, to present at Ozark Con, <laughs> the second largest QRP event in North America down in Branson, Missouri, a talk on zero cost QRP. Well, the world kind of stopped in what it was doing somewhere along that time frame. We all know that a virus came out of mysterious origins and changed our way of life. It affected those that it infected, damaging their minds, transforming those infected into flesh devouring, brain eating, shambling, mindless zombies. And so my plans for Ozark Con were dashed, utterly. The infection spread amongst the populace. We've seen enough zombie movies to understand how that works. And as, as people became affected, our civilization just came to an utter standstill. Hence my talk, Amateur Radio in the Time of Zombies. But what we saw was that as this zombie plague spread, we were left with no power, no internet, no landline, no cell phone, no communication, as those people responsible for those luxuries of modern life left their posts and roamed the countryside looking for brains to consume. But without communication, so much of our, our regular life disappears. Communication allows us to, to, to procure logistics, supplies, to coordinate motion, to, to defend against the shambling mob of the undead. But communication is absolutely essential. Communication is what amateur radio is about. And when all else fails, amateur radio can come through. So my story was that somehow I missed the evacuation order as those around me joined the, the zombie horde. I alone was unaffected. I holed up in a typical suburban home, managed to barricade myself in, and uh, the last messages that I received were that uh, the, the military would come through and cleanse the area of the affected. I needed to get out of there and I needed to communicate my position. My challenge was before this occurred, I needed to build a ham transceiver in the 12 hours remaining of this day using whatever components I could salvage or improvise in this typical suburban home. But with no power, no electronic tools, I had to build everything from scratch. Before I was overcome and overwhelmed by those seeking out my delicious brain to consume. In order to build communication equipment, ham radio in particular, I've done this before. I'm, I'm a QRP guy. I like to build stuff. I like to improvise uh, salvage parts. But th these things are done in optimal circumstances. I've got no power. I need a power supply, something to operate this radio. I need components to build it out of. I need to build an antenna. I need to find the tools to build all this with. Somehow, somewhere inside this house, I'm going to have to find these things. First step is to inventory the surroundings. It's eight o'clock AM. I've got 12 hours. Inside this house, I need to find something with which to power my radio. Uh, looking around, 
the, there's a riding lawnmower in the garage. Its battery is long dead. It's not been run in some time. There's flashlights, other accessories, dry cells all over the place that I can use. Uh, storage batteries, there's no car in the driveway, nothing I can draw from there. Uh, rechargeable tools, they're all discharged. Uh, there's a, a rechargeable battery in every UPS that's uh, with a, a computer. There's none of that in this house though. So I'm going to have to find something to power a radio. So as I scavenge around and look around, I find the wall telephone. I pull that down thinking that there may be some usable parts inside. There's a smoke detector. Every house has a smoke detector or three or four. Smoke detector is going to be the source of something very useful because inside every smoke detector, there's a nine volt battery and a little flashy indicator LED. And with those liberated, I've got test equipment. The LED is going to start illuminating if there's more than about uh, 1.7 volts on it. So I can use this as an impromptu voltmeter. If I make a loop of wire to connect its two legs together and place that in an RF field, it will glow in the presence of uh, an, a radio frequency electromagnetic field. So it's a field strength indicator. It can test for continuity in conjunction with the battery, test for RF. So right here, I've got test equipment and this nine volt battery can operate my QRP radio that I'm going to build. Hey, here's a find in the uh, empty bedroom, formerly occupied by a teenager. Here's a, a Walkman. And you can kind of guess the vintage of the person that used it by how long ago since you've seen one of these. But here we've got headphones and headphones are a very key ingredient to building a radio. You've got to be able to hear what it is and who it is that you're communicating with. A quick review of the garage indicates there's a propane torch. Propane torch is going to be a heat source that I can use for soldering and other things. So my plan's starting to come together. Ah, down in the basement is the graveyard of all the old electronics, the dead VCR um, and a television, an old CRT type television rendered obsolete by uh, high definition TV. But this is a, going to be a fantastic source of parts. I'm definitely lucking out here. Now, once I get parts, how am I going to tie them all together? Well, there's a notorious book by uh, Reverend George Dobbs, every QRP guy knows this, where he describes a radio that he puts together using screws to mount all the components together. Well, maybe I can find screws, maybe I can't. Let's take a look. Well, next best thing, here's some nails that I found in the garage, copper plated weather stripping nails. I know that solder is going to take to those very nicely and I can drive them into a block of wood to make a breadboard construction. I'll use these, this is, this is a great stroke of luck. Now, what am I going to use for solder? Well, uh, lead will work in a pinch. I'd really like to have some eutectic 10 lid, uh, 60, 40 alloy, but let's look around and see what can be found. There's some tire weights uh, possible, except there's no car in the driveway. Tire weights are an antimony lead alloy. They're not really great for solder, better than nothing, but I don't have any. Fishing sinkers could be used. They are usually pure lead. Uh, the PC board of the television is going to be loaded with solder. I know I can get some from there. That telephone that I had, let's pull that apart and see what's inside. Now here's a little secret that uh, not everyone knows, that in uh, cheap consumer electronics, the illusion of quality is associated with weight. 
something that's really lightweight is going to be viewed as cheap. And if you pull apart a lot of things like landline telephone headsets, desk lamps, or other pieces of electronics, they have weight added to them to give the illusion of quality or so that the uh, power cord doesn't pull them off of, off of a table or desk. Inside the handset of that telephone is a lead block. And that lead block is 6040 eutectic lead tin alloy. You would think that if you're going to add weight to something, you could find something cheaper than lead tin. But the manufacturer of the telephone ends up with a lot of scrap waste solder at the end of the manufacturing process, which cannot be recycled because it's contaminated. So what they do is they cast it into these weights, add them to the handset, and now you've got a heavy handset that feels like it's good, solid, quality plastic. So this I'm going to use for solder. Shave off little bits with my pocket knife and then heat that up and apply it. Perfect solution. But lead solder, lead tin solder by itself doesn't stick very well. We know that there's going to be oxides uh, throughout uh, both the, the, the solder and the components that I'm going to use. So we need some kind of flux. Well, I've played with different kinds of improvised fluxes. Pine sap would be ideal because that's what rosin is. Uh, I'd rather not be tromping around outside gathering pine sap from the local pine trees, knowing that there's zombies nearby that could possibly come and take my brain. So let's keep on looking. Uh, beeswax is another impromptu flux. You could possibly use a candle. The stearic acid that's used for hardening candles is also a half decent flux. There's other chemical fluxes, uh, acid type fluxes, uh, like the zinc chloride that you could uh, liberate from a dry cell battery, citric acid, or even aspirin from medicine cabinet. Those also work as fluxes. So as I look around, looking for something that's usable, ah, uh, how about that stroke of luck? There's a bluegrass musician in the house. And with every fiddle, there's going to be a block of rosin. I'm definitely on a roll now. And it's 10 o'clock. I need all the luck that I can get. So the next agenda is to start taking apart the television and seeing what's inside that that can possibly be of use. Well, the old CRT televisions are loaded with wonderful things. And I'm of an age where I recalled the ham radio magazines of the 1960s and 70s were full of construction articles where you could take a junk television and liberate the sweep tubes and other components, high voltage transformers, and make a novice transmitter. Well, those days are a little bit past and behind us. There's no sweep tubes in these TVs, but there's lots of other good things. The deflection coils are wonderful. Look at all the wire that's wrapped around that. That's going to come in handy. There's insulated hookup wire that will be great for connecting components on my improvised radio. And look at that circuit board, chock full of parts, more parts than I would ever need to build a simple QRP transceiver. So the way that we can get those parts off, I removed the board from the TV chassis set it on its edge, heated the backside with the blowtorch, and pulled all the components off with the solder melted. Very simple and very quick. Now from that TV printed circuit board, this is the list of parts that I got off of it. Resistors and capacitors, diodes, transistors, and because this television set is essentially an RF device. The majority of the capacitors and transistors in there are good RF components. I know that they're going to do something for me, uh, but I don't recognize a lot of those transistor part numbers. We'll figure something out. But down at the bottom, most significant and best of all is the crystal the color burst crystal in every color television, 
0.579 megahertz. This is a watering hole CW frequency, which just happens to be one of the designated emergency frequencies for zombie relief. I am indeed in luck. Fortunately, I have with me my po post-apocalyptic guide to Japanese transistors, and I can look up the prefixes of all of these parts and uh, a lot of these are indeed good silicon power devices and RF devices. And with my continuity checker, I can sort out some uh, NPN devices and set those aside for use in construction. Now, one other thing to remember, the standard pinout for American parts is very different from that of Japanese parts. You can't assume that the pinout is emitter base collector as is uh, the case for American transistors. It's now 12 o'clock noon. The day is getting away from me. Let's build a soldering iron. Well, back in the old days before uh, electrical soldering irons were, were so common, the big old uh, soldering irons that you would use for metalwork and the like, you would uh, heat that up over a blowtorch and utilize a heavy copper tip to retain the, the heat for use in soldering. Well, found a screwdriver, some house wiring, and wrapped the end to get some thermal mass, sharpened the tip. That's going to be my soldering iron to heat that up over the propane torch and apply it to the circuit. Now then, with parts in hand and construction tools, it's time to start building the transceiver. And the question is, what am I going to build? Well, there are in the QRP world a number of very classical circuits. There is the infamous Pixie, QRP transceiver operating CW that you can now get from China for just a couple of bucks. Uh, hard to think that you can even get the components for that much, but that, that circuit should be, if you are a QRP designer worth your weight, uh, etched in memory. Well, maybe, but you should know the circuit for a Colpitts oscillator or a Pierce oscillator, which would use a crystal. And all of these are going to be uh, required as part of a very simple transceiver. But we want to keep it simple with a minimum number of components so that we have the least amount of opportunity to mess things up. We'll use the KISS principle. Keep it simple, survivor. This is a circuit that was published a number of years ago, and uh, it is two transistors. It generates a CWRF signal from a Colpitts oscillator circuit. Or is it an Armstrong circuit? Regardless, there's feedback in there, a tuned circuit in the collector, and it's very serviceable and its output feeds an audio transistor and is transformer coupled to headphones. And with something of that simplicity, it should be easy to put together and build. So let's pick component values based on what is found on the TV chassis. Put it together and see if it works. We need an audio transformer. Well, pull the wall ward out uh, basically any power transformer with about a, uh, a 10 to one voltage ratio will serve as an audio transformer as well. So we can liberate this and put it to good use. We have no test equipment that can measure inductance, but what we can do is come up with a very close value using Wheeler's formula. This is published in every ARRL handbook, and if you didn't just memorize the answers for your technician exam, you probably have this memorized. I certainly do, but the inductance of a coil is proportional to the number of turns squared, the radius of the coil squared, divided by the quantity nine times radius plus 10 times the length of the coil. 
And with that, we can come up with something that should be very close to an optimal value. So this is the construction technique. Drive those little nails into the board, solder them together and back the components down. It's exacting work, but it, it goes together. Looks like it's gonna work, folks. And this is the final result on a block of uh, two by four liberated from the garage. Broomstick wound with uh, bell wire from the garage. All our little components there, all war our wall wart transformer tied in to serve as a, a audio transformer. Nine volt battery clip, put it together, listen to it and I can hear noise. There's white noise in there, so it's doing something. Now we have to come up with an antenna and it's four o'clock and we're running out of daytime. Let's take these wire coils off of the, uh, the CRT and that television. There's a lot of wire here, plenty to make an 80 meter dipole to use that uh, 7 point, uh, or 3.579 megahertz crystal. As we unwind that, there, uh, try to get an estimate of what, what is contained here. Wrap it on a cardboard uh, improvised spool. In those two coils, there's 150 feet of doubled up 26 gauge magnet wire and 300 feet of 32 gauge magnet wire. The 26 gauge should be self-supporting uh, over uh, 67 foot uh, interval between the center insulator and the, the opposite end. It's a two story house. We can support the center off of the, the eaves that I can, I can uh, reach outside the window to get. Let's figure out what it's gonna take to make this work. And we need some kind of transmission line to connect between the output of our little transceiver and the antenna. We'd love to have some nice 50 ohm, but we'll take something close. Well, it just happens that zip cord, be it lamp cord or an extension cord, speaker cable, that parallel line transmission line comes out to something really close to 75 ohms. And all the, the poor impoverished novice kids back in the 50s and 60s, a lot of these guys use that. And there's plenty of that here in the house. We can, we can use that to connect between the, uh, the dipole feed point and our little transceiver. Time's a wasting. We need to get busy. Six o'clock PM. Now we need to measure the antenna. I don't have a tape measure on me, or maybe I do. Well, fingertip to fingertip, I'm just about six foot. So I'm gonna measure my antenna using the fingertip to fingertip tape measure. Measured out 67 feet either side. How am I gonna get it up? Well, there's strategically located trees that I can make use of. I think uh, homeowners association bylaws are no longer in effect to prohibit me from doing so. So let's go ahead. I'm gonna pull the fishing line out of the garage, try to get a, a line over the tree and tie the wire to that. All the while looking over my shoulder make sure none of those brain hungry zombified folks are, are trying to get after me, but it's doable and it is done. But it's now getting pretty late in the day and the moans and groans that I hear approaching the cul-de-sac tell me that uh, I need to get myself out of there. I need to get rescued. So let's put this together. Hooking up the battery, I adjusted the little pot on my breadboard to the point where I hear regeneration occur. And yes, I can hear CW signals. The two wires that I have for use as a Morse code key, I'm gonna start tapping them together, generating my signal. Da 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 it, da 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 did it, da 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 it, da 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 did it. CQZ, 
as the pretty girl in the picture here is telling us, that, that is the new distress signal, CQZ, come quick zombies. Is anybody going to hear me? Again and again, I send out my transmission. But I hear banging outside the house. The horde has gathered and they are hungry. Feverishly, I repeat my distress signal. Will anybody hear me? Will anybody come to my rescue? Eh, hey, I'm here telling about it, aren't I? So this has been a fun little fable. It was an interesting uh, thought experiment. I actually did gather up these components, built my little radio, and uh, lo and behold, it worked. Uh, it was a great assurance that uh, should real zombies come, I might be able to do something. Um, you know, as, as hams, this is the idea be behind our field day where we go out in the field in less than ideal conditions, put up our antennas and fire up our generators for a practice, just in case we have to uh, rely upon our wits and our skills in less than ideal conditions. 2020 has been an amazing year in terms of natural disasters and things that just go wrong from the hurricanes that have uh, pelted the Gulf Coast to the derecho winds that devastated the Cedar Rapids area. That left many of us without power for over a week, without internet for a week. Cell phone was out for days. Uh, it was uh, an eye-opening experience for a lot of us. Uh, the hams in the Cedar Rapids area really rose to the occasion. The, uh, the Cedar Rapids repeater was in activity uh, virtually 24 hours a day for the first several days. But aside from that, uh, these natural disasters and occurrences happen all over. You can't predict them. And the common denominator amongst all of them is communication is the infrastructure is fragile and it tends to be the first thing that's affected. And it's the place where ham radio is needed the most. So all of these skills that, uh, that we've talked about here, the ability to think on your feet, to have some knowledge of how to put together a station in less than ideal conditions, improvise it if necessary, and even build your own equipment. All of, all of these skills may come in handy someday. And to, to familiarize yourself with these, uh, this is the time to do it. So as you look at emergency preparedness, you have to have the right equipment, the proper mental preparation. And as I mentioned again, uh, field day is that opportunity to acquire the equipment, test it, and, and familiarize yourself with all of the things that can go wrong in putting it together. And for those events where you don't have your equipment with you, the old uh, MacGyver experience of, of building something with uh, bubble gum and zip ties and duct tape, that's invaluable. You need to be able to think outside the box if it comes to repairing something or improvising something if you don't have the things that you really need. QRP equipment is really, really an ideal testing ground for all of these skills. Uh, I'm part of a group, part of several groups of QRP enthusiasts and uh, to see some of the scratch built, home built radios that these fellows are putting together is really inspiring. And uh, it's something that I encourage the rest of us to look into. Even if you're not dedicated uh, CW operators, there's something very, very satisfying with building something, maybe from a, a magazine article circuit, maybe something you've uh, designed from scratch, but to make that work and get that first QSO out of it, there is no other experience that's like that. So for all of the crazy things that 2020 has sent our way, 
be it COVID, be it the derecho, be it the Western wildfires, the solution for a zombie attack is zero cost QRP. Thank you very much, everyone. Excellent. That was excellent. Um, you want me to, you still got your, uh, no, you don't. Okay. I think, I'm, yeah. There for a moment, I thought we still had desk sharing, the desktop sharing going on. All right. Uh, got quite a herd of people here tonight. That was a good presentation. Are there any questions out there? One comment in the chat. Okay, go ahead. Does anyone remember the pup generator, a lawnmower engine, and a vehicle alternator, and you have a lot of 14 volt DC? Oh yeah, that's, that's a fantastically popular project. I've seen quite a few of those. That's, that's something good to build on. Okay. And also a comment that ladies also build stuff. Yes, they build some really good stuff. Okay. Um, Lee, do you got anything over there? Uh, no, I'm reading the same comments in the chat. Um, there were there are at least three women here tonight that said, yes, we do build. All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see here. Uh, it was fun and innovative. So yeah, this was a great presentation. Thank you, David. I enjoyed this immensely. And I don't see any hands up or any questions at this point. I don't either. Are there any comments? Anything you want to add? Anybody want to add anything? Add their experience or whatever? Sure. Go ahead, John. Yeah, I just, uh, I was trying to find that hands up thing. For uh, Dave? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I built something of yours and you had to fix it for me. <laughs> sure enough. Okay, and I just want to let you know I found a uh, perfect soldering iron for uh, making sure I get the switches uh, <laughs> done right. Uh, let me unwind the thing here. Make sure I put enough heat on those uh, switches next time I build one. Uh, instead of using the Heiko iron, I uh, have one of uh, one of these things. Ah, uh, yeah. The old telephone standards. Okay. That's got some thermal mass. Yes. And I've used the uh, tuner and with QRP and thank you. Gladly. Thank you. And uh, here on the East Coast, um, I know UD to Bill UDT is on here. And I was just wondering, uh, you know, if we need speakers for Ham Radio University in uh, January, because we're going to be doing it via Zoom. Uh, perhaps Bill UDT can uh, grab you and you can do a presentation like you just made because I think a lot of people would like it. I don't know Sounds if he's on great. here or not. Uh, W2UDT, uh, Bill. He's the uh, assistant director of the Hudson Division. So just out of curiosity, I'm going to pass it along. Uh, I, th I think a lot of people might uh, like the uh, presentation. Sure. Thank you. One other comment from before. Someone said that eutectic solder is actually 63% tin and 37% lead. <laughs> and here's another comment. Excellent presentation. We love the story and you walking us through why on earth we still have an old TV <laughs> in our basement. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. 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 So, I want to know where he got. The, I want to know where he got the blowtorch. He was lucky he had. He had uh, propane in. I have three. A <laughs> little bit of plumbing. You could oh, have another comment that uh, motor in your chainsaw. Mm. 
Okay, let's try to get the hands up for the questions rather than just jumping in here if possible down at the bottom of your, uh, you see a place to raise your hand. We're starting to, starting to double on each other. Um, I've got a comment, David. Um, uh, some of us ladies also build musical Tesla coils. That's new to me. Have you heard of that? You're a musician. Oh, definitely. There's a few videos out on YouTube of these sort of things. Uh, a Tesla coil relies upon a spark gap to generate the high uh, intensity pulse to excite the coil. And if you excite that spark gap with a, a frequency, you can basically make it uh, buzz at a musical tone. And there's some monstrous sized coils out there that are musical. Um, somebody else says they have a VCR in beeswax. <laughs> <laughs> You've got them thinking now. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's my, that's my goal. Okay, are there any more questions? Uh, raise a hand type of a thing. I don't see anybody raising their hand. Yep, there's two hands oh, up. There are, there they are. Doug, you want to take it away? W4DBL, Doug. Yeah, the space bar didn't unmute it tonight. Um, huh? Just somebody mentioned the propane torch. Just a quick uh, thought for anybody out there that's interested. The butane cylinders that you get for the little hot plates that uh, you see guys cooking omelets on and stuff like that, uh, I use one to hook, cook stuff. I bought a propane torch or a butane torch that clips onto the top of that thing. I actually bought it in, I think, Sydney or China for like a couple bucks, but they're out there on Amazon. Uh, just something to throw in a toolbox or one of those cylinders are cheap, they're available, but it's just something to have around as a backup for something that needs a little bit of heat. And That's I'll great. shut up. Thanks, guys. Good presentation. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Okay, um, I think that was Doug. Let's let's bring on Joe. W A two J O E. Yeah, excellent presentation. It was a fantastic uh, exercise, and I really relate to this because uh, since the beginning of quarantine, my family, I've actually been putting together what what I affectionately refer to as my zombie box. And uh, that's uh, a box full of stuff that you can throw in the back of the car that everybody's going to be scrambling for that you've already got. But one thing that occurred to me is that these days, it's going to be harder and harder to <clears throat> find any sort of equipment um, that's got components in it. Uh, you know, I think you were really lucky to find a CRT TV that's got resistors and caps and all kinds of stuff on it. But, you know, that's a rarity these days. Even the phones, it's been a long time. Uh, since we've had phones like that. Everything's microprocessors, surface mount, and uh, you know, I think that's just something to think about, that, that those components that you can unsolder and put together are going to be harder and harder to come by, unless you're deliberate about it. Um, and now I'm wondering what else I should put in my zombie box, you know, maybe some bags of parts, who knows, so just something to think about. That is an excellent, excellent point. I do a lot of work with uh, Boy Scouts and school groups to to get the kids familiar with electronics and with the notion of hands-on hobbies that you can do with electronics. And your observation about everything being surface-bound is very valid. And so because of that, before I go and talk to any group of kids, I'll swing by the Goodwill or the Salvation Army and I'll pick up a, a clock radio or a VCR for $3.77 and I'll take it with a screwdriver and some pliers and let the kids just tear into it so they can see what's in it, see what a resistor looks like and associate that with something actual and physical other than the, the little pepper grains that's inside a, a surface mount telephone. Okay, um, I guess that's all from Joe. If it is, we'll just move on to Rick. Yeah, well, thanks. Uh, um, the, um, I, I just thought of one thing, the source of components 
I remember uh, Arnie Coro, uh, the Cuban, uh, he, uh, he came up with a design for a, uh, a transmitter where most of the parts came from a compact fluorescent light bulb. Uh, there's enough, there was enough in there to make a transmitter anyway. But anyway, I have, the, uh, I have the old VCR around the house. We probably have some beeswax here somewhere. But the most <laughs> important item uh, sitting here on my desk, uh, and I don't have batteries in it right now, it runs off triple A's, uh, you're going to, you know, I, I don't remember these formulas for winding the coil and everything. Well, this is a wiki reader. This contains the English uh, version of Wikipedia. Uh, it runs on uh, AAA batteries that are not in it right now. Um, so I'm confident that formula is in there somewhere. So I can, uh, I can always look it up. And um, I, got one of, I got this on eBay a few years ago. I don't think they're available anymore, but you can download the entire Wikipedia uh, you know, put it on a flash drive and run it on your phone or something. The advantage of this one is that uh, it has such low power consumption. Uh, but uh, but having that information in one place, I, I always, uh, I've never had to use it, but I always feel better knowing that I have this sitting on my desk here. That is brilliant. I, I like that a lot. You know, on, on a similar vein, I have the largest size SD card that I can put in my phone. Uh, I think it's 256 gig. I have it loaded. There are 6,000 books in there, uh, every electrical reference book that I can find. And yeah, I'll have to look things up every now and then. Yeah, you know, and it's it's very unlikely, but if I ever get caught in a time warp and sent back into the past, <laughs> this is really going to be uh, showing value there. Not uh, likely, but uh, you know, you never know. Awesome. Very good. Okay. Uh, well, ladies, see anything in the chat? I do. I'm going to read one of the comments again. Um, Tom W3TDH, Tom Horn, has a comment. When is a mobile a fixed station under the field, field day rules? When it is feeding an antenna that is not mounted on the vehicle and is getting its power from somewhere other than the vehicle's engine. Pup generator and slingshot dipole, and you can make good use of the 27 hour field day rule. Nice. Thank you, Tom. All right. And that's all I see for comments right now. Okay. Barry, do you see anything? Nope, nothing. Just a whole bunch of people saying that they're doing music using different Tesla coils and stuff. <laughs> yeah, a lot of stuff surfacing here. Well, Tom, yep. you got your hand up. How about something from you? I just wanted to share that uh, I do presentations for school kids and the public as opportunity arises, uh, much more recently, of course, on uh, manual telegraphy, uh, you know, in the earliest days of telegraphy. Um, and I do it at STEM nights and places like that. Now, some of the teachers hate it because the kids like the telegraphy stuff more than they like their lectures. But uh, when the kids can leave there with a paper tape with their name and Morse on it, uh, the kids really like that. And then, you know, the physics teachers get to like me because I say, what's the difference between all this stuff I've got on this desk and that watch you're wearing or that phone you have in your pocket? And they say, well, uh, and I say, absolutely nothing. It's all based on on and off. It's human beings that put the work into making it work to do what they needed to do. This was the first stuff they used it for. That stuff in your pocket is the latest stuff we're using it for. And if you want to grab onto the bandwagon and have your future assured, you'll learn to do things with on and off that people never thought of before. So pay attention to your physics class. And then I get the big smile from the physics instructors. Excellent. Okay, um, we'll go back to the chat for a moment and see if there's anything there before we pick up with John. Um, no. Everybody have an ARRL handbook, even if it's an older one, because there's lots and lots and lots of valuable stuff that people have probably never seen in an older handbook. And someone also mentioned the app everycircuit.com. Interesting. I don't see uh, anything complete to you. No, those, those were good, Barry. Thanks. Okay, let's jump over to John. Uh, K2IZ, I think it is, in New York. Yeah, take a look at that app for everycircuit.com. It's everything is, uh, everything is it's, it's a visual 3D and everything. Every circuit you want, whatever you want to plug in, take a look at it. Okay, and then also, 
instead of using a fishing pole, uh, at work we used to use, uh, when we put the drop wires into the pole, you use something called a J-hook or a heavy bolt. And you just tie a uh, piece of twine around that thing and just start doing half swings. And you let that thing go, that's just as good as a fishing pole. And you have better control over it. Well, I said, we saw that thing, though, uh, everycircuit.com. I think a lot of people might be interested in that one. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I don't see more hands. Let's go back to the chat. Lee, do you say anything? Uh, something from Dan in California, but I think he'd have to come and explain it. I'm not really sure what he's saying. So, But that's all I've got. I looked up in Wikipedia how big Wikipedia is, and that's what it said. Oh, 30 point Oh, that's how big Wikipedia is. Yeah. Oh. Fit about okay. eight copies of it on a uh, thumb drive that fits on your key ring. Okay. Is there anything else there, Lee? No, I don't see anything, Barry. I don't see anything. I don't okay. either. Anybody got any comments or experience whatever? Does Oscar have, Oscar, did you raise your hand? I couldn't tell. Okay. Well, Al in Idaho has something to say. Go ahead and take it, Al. Yes, <coughs> excuse me. Yes, uh, locally here in Boise, uh, them guys would have loved to visit Mr. Bob. You know who I'm talking about, Mr. Bob? Yes, Broadway Bob. Uh, if you go to his house, he's got piles of piles of stuff on the floor and in his basement and his attic. And he's been taking stuff apart for all his life. And he saved every bit of it. You have to know Broadway Bob to understand that. Uh -huh. But yes, that's, that's exactly right. Okay, John, in New York. Yeah, Lee, I see SM after your name? Yes. For the for Iowa, right? Correct. I was the, I was the section communications manager 30 years ago for NLI. Oh, really? Yeah. Back in, um, back in the days when you had to type out a bed sheet about that long to send in your column every month to QST. Wow. Yeah, we didn't so have that would have been 1980, that would have been 1989, 88, no. right around in there? No, 70s and 80s, mid-70s, early 80s. Gotcha. That's back, that's back when we had the, uh, the National Convention at the Waldorf Astoria, and then the following year they had it at the Playboy Club in Great Gorge, New Jersey. Okay. Which was fantastic. Well, thank you for your service. Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, the Playboy Club was fantastic. And then we had Ron Swoboda as the guest speaker. So. Aren't memories great? <laughs> he could probably write a book on his experience. Yeah. It's a good All chance right. to get to know each other. Thank you. Yes. And this, that's what these Zoom meetings do, too. They give us a good chance to share and share a life. Okay, you see anything in chat there, uh, Lee? Uh, let me scroll down and nothing new. No. And you concur, Barry? We concur. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this has been a good presentation. I think we've all enjoyed it. Um, I really, uh, I, very I wanna, much. Oh, yes. Um, by the way, this is Lee's idea. She's the one, and, we, and she followed up on it. And uh, oh. so give her the the attaboys for this, the goodles or whatever. No, 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 no. This is David. Not, not oh, David nothing to do with this. David did the presentation. <laughs> it was you that suggested, David. So we really thank you for that suggestion. Anybody out there got some suggestions, please send it to us. We would like to have, to have more of these kind of things. All right. I'm not seeing anything more. Um, unless there is more, I think we'll start wrapping this up. Uh, Again, it's can, been a great. Can I get your email address real quick? Uh, put in chat. Sorry. No, no, uh, no, no, no. Lee, put put that in chat. It put my email address in chat. See. It's my call sign at awrl.net. Or org, either one. 
Mm -hmm. Or Gmail or Yahoo. <laughs> I have a few aliases in the <laughs> So it's W A Zero U I G. And you can find me on the ADRO website and and on in this forum often. Yes, you'll see here often here. Okay. You know, coast of the Gulf of Mexico. They're starting to activate the hams for the Salvation Army and the Red Cross. So if anyone's involved down there, please be ready and please stay safe. This hurricane is going to be really bad. All right. Thank you, Barry. Are they predicting a level two already? It's going to be a level three or more. Three or more. Wow. Yeah. Okay, Somebody's so, asking about how often this forum meets. Dan, you want to address that? Sure. Uh, this this forum, <laughs> we meet on every Wednesdays and Thursdays, same time, same place. Uh, it's different. Uh, on Thursdays, we try to keep it related to uh, Aries in some fashion or another. Um, and then uh, uh, on Wednesdays, it's more of a, a general amateur radio type of thing. We'll talk about... Uh, everything from the ARL and how it's benefit you or what you like to see us do to whatever your interests are in amateur radio. We try to get the presentations on, on those for Wednesday. Sometimes we get so many in one or the other, we have to double up. We have to put uh, same type of presentation on a Wednesday or Thursday, but we try not to do that. Again, we really want your suggestions. We have, I, there's a tremendous planning team I, I've got put together on this. Uh, since I put it together, they've pretty much taken over. They're doing a great job, and uh, we need to give them uh, material to work with. Uh, they, they're good at uh, improvising ways to make it happen. Okay, and um, you can uh, send emails to, well, you can send, obviously, you can send it to, uh, to Lee there, the address she just gave, or myself, K7, <laughs> she's shaking her head, no, 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 oh, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> 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 anyway, you can send them to me. I get a lot of emails and I enjoy them. So K7REX at ARRL.net or org, either one. Okay, is there anything else out there, folks? Thank you all for coming. Yes. Okay, with that in mind, I'm going to close Watch out for it. zombies. Yes, watch out for zombies. I'm going to close this out. I will be sending out uh, uh, a video link to it afterwards for those that um, missed it or couldn't be here tonight. 73s, everyone. And please be safe.